started uh, working on photoconductors a number of years ago, trying to use quantum dots to sense light, uh, especially light in the, in, in the shortwave infrared and between one and two micron. The physics of that is very similar to the physics of solar energy conversion into electricity. You take light in, you create charges, and you extract the charges out. In photoconduction or in photo detection, you're trying to uh, count the number of photons that come in, trying to detect light. In solar energy, you're trying to convert the power of those photons into power that you can use. But it's very similar physics. Silicon works so well because it doesn't have any defects. You create a carrier in there, and it just diffuses without hitting any defects and can find the electrodes. A quantum dot is a very small particle that's all surface. That surface is all defect. And you're trying to get a charge, you create a charge, then you're trying to make that charge hop from dot to dot to dot to dot to dot, all the way to the electrode. And at every hop, you have a, a possibility for destroying that charge, or at least the energy in that charge, because it's full of defects. And so over the years, as we got better and better at understanding the physics of these cells and how to make the material more compatible with the specifications that we're, what we're trying to get out, and really probing the basic device physics of all the layers that come together to make an efficient solar cell, um, I was surprised how it worked a lot better than I expected. That the surfaces that I thought were just going to be all these defects turn out not to be as important as possible, that you can manage them. You can begin to raise the efficiency slowly. And so now we've gone from a few percent to close to 10% in just the last few years. Um, and at this point, I'm no longer a skeptic. I think that there's no reason why we can't go to 15% or even higher in the next few years. Um, the advantage of the quantum dot for solar is that it's a material that's made in solution. And you can assemble these cells at room temperature just from solution on substrates other than glass. <clears throat> Another advantage is that the, the band gap, uh, the energy that you can create, is tunable by changing the size of the dot or by changing the material that the quantum dot is made out of. And in principle, that should allow you to create what are called tendon cells in a very um, more straightforward fashion than what they're made today. And what tendon cells bring to the table is the possibility of increasing the efficiency above uh, what silicon has right now. And so those two things together, the solution processability at room temperature and the possibility of creating tandem cells, uh, make me think that we, we, we need to keep going in that direction and see how far we can push it. The latest uh, work that we did that, that, that we published recently, uh, we showed cells that had shelf lives for hundreds of days, even longer. And somehow the quantum dots ended up being um, self-packaged. It was a layered device, and as a result, the top layer seems to have be playing a role in preventing the, the functional layer from degrading. 100 days is no, nowhere near 30 years. And it's the same issue that we had when we were dealing with displays where in the lab you can make a device that lasts for a few hundred hours for the display. But to commercialize it, you need 30,000 hours. But there's the proof of concept there that you can extend the life from a few minutes to 100 hours. And if you can begin to understand that, then there's the possibility of taking it the next step. An advantage of tandem cells is that it allows you to uh, go beyond what's called the uh, SQ limit, the Shockley Quasar limit, of around 30% for power conversion efficiency um, in a single uh, stack uh, solar cell. So a tandem cell would have, let's say, two stacks, where the top stack absorbs mostly the greenish part of the color spectrum, and the bottom stack absorbs mostly the redder part of the spectrum of the solar spectrum. And that allows you to uh, increase the potential efficiency beyond this thermodynamic limit for one stack. These tandem cells are used today in satellites, for example, where uh, efficiency 
and uh, weight are really important and cost is not so important. So you have these cells that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars that are really efficient that uh, go up into space. It'd be great if we could have similar efficiencies but Earth-based at costs that are similar to silicon. Um, the surface area is, is, a, is a critical performance parameter. If you have something on your roof and you can double the efficiency, you'd, you'd use that, right? I mean, it would be the difference between not being able to power your whole house and suddenly you, you have extra energy to power your car in addition to your house. So efficiency is, is critical. Um, and, and if you can make a tandem cell that is cost effective, uh, then you've really achieved something.